Thank you, everyone. Um, it's fantastic to be here and be in a room with a bunch of people who are talking about the player-centered approach to sports. Because a player-centered approach is, it's really the, the new wave. And I want to start with two caveats. Number one, I believe that a player-centered approach is not only the way that we increase participation and get the next generation of fans and players and coaches and grow this beautiful game, but it's also the path to elite player development. When we create an environment that focuses on what our players need, then we have the most high-performing players. And number two, and just to kind of set the table for this whole next two days, when we start talking about player-centered, and we start talking about things like enjoyment in sports, what happens is a lot of people come out of the woodwork and say, oh, it's fun, it's not competition, that's no good. And that's not what we're talking about here at all. Because when players enjoy the sport, they actually become more competitive. Now, I am a very competitive guy. My background's in sport. I, I've coached at every level from the youth to uh, the collegiate level in the US. I've coached national team players. I do not believe in participation awards. I do not believe in handing out trophies to everyone. The more trophies we give out, the less each one means. But the current sports system right now, it's not creating better players, it's creating bitter players. And around the world right now, about 70% of children are dropping out of youth sports by the time they reach the age of 13. And this is what we need to fix. Now one thing they say when you're a speaker is never change your talk right before you're about to go on, but I did. Because um, about two hours ago, a friend sent me this picture. And I think this is very apropos to everything that we're going to talk about here. That we have knowledge and we have experience. And it's apropos because a lot of us have a lot of knowledge. But until we share that knowledge, until we share our ex experiences with everyone, then we never really learn. And number two, when we think about our players, our job as coaches, our job as administrators, our job as parents is to give them lots of knowledge. But until they have time to get the experience, until we realize that development in sport is a marathon and it's not a sprint, they will never play, the game will never look like the adult version of the game. So it's our job here this weekend to really think about what we can do to give our kids the time and the environment so that they can take all the knowledge they get from us and turn it into experience. And that's when we're really going to get a next generation of great players. So what we're really talking about here today is whose game is this? And I, I love this picture because this picture to me represents youth sports in a nutshell. There's eight kids in one little tiny area, all fighting over one toy, aka the puck. A couple of kids see it. A couple are in the background discussing, well, you know, why are our parents yelling at us and telling us to spread out? Why don't they just throw six more pucks out here and we will spread out? And this makes me think of why I'm here on the stage tonight, because about three years ago, I was standing on the sideline of my six-year-old daughter's soccer game. And it looks very much like this. There's a giant scrum of players, and it moves up and down the field. And there's lots of laughing and, and giggling. And every once in a while, a player breaks out of the scrum and scores a goal on the right goal. Sometimes they break out and score on the wrong goal. It doesn't really matter. They're equally as excited. They have twice the chance of success. And so I'm watching this game, and this is what sports is supposed to be about. The coaches are positive. The kids are learning. The parents don't really care about the result. Well, right next door on this particular day, there was a competitive 10-year-old boys soccer game. And I put the word competitive in quotes because it wasn't the kids who were competing harder, it was the adults. It was the coaches. It was the parents. And one boy made a bad pass, and the other team stole it and scored a goal. And he gets yanked off, this coach jumps off the bench, pulls him out of the game, screaming at him, his dad's screaming at him, and I'm watching this, saying, this is what's wrong. This boy is in a place that's supposed to be fun, that's supposed to be about learning and enjoyment, and he's just made a mistake. And when he makes this mistake, he's being punished for it. See, when I was growing up, I would say that sports was about children competing against other children. And now, so many places I go, sports is about adults competing against other adults through children. And this is what we have to change. So tonight I want to really talk about three things. First of all, as 
coaches and as parents, as administrators, what are the obstacles to creating this player-centered environment? The second thing I want to talk about is the psychology of performance. What do children need both internally and externally in their sports environment so that they can really play their best and perform their best and enjoy the experience? And third, then just giving you guys a couple of ideas, things that can set the table for our panel discussion, things that can set the table for our discussion in the next two days, and things that you can take back to your own clubs and your own communities. Sound good? So just a quick show of hands. How many played sports growing up? Show of hands. Good. Pretty much everyone. How many think that sports now is really different than when you grew up? Yeah. It's very different. The pressure, the stress on kids is completely different. Now, when I was at that 10-year-old boys game, and I'm watching what's happening, what hit me was, does this environment exist anywhere else? It makes complete sense to us that if our kid is coloring, we don't scream at him or her for coloring outside the lines. And we don't go to math class and go to a test and yell at the kids to carry the one. Because that doesn't make sense. It's not helpful. Yet in sports, for some reason, that's the environment we've created. So three years ago at that day, I started on a journey myself. And what I did on that journey was I researched everything I could find about long-term player development about psychology, about parenting, about coaching best practices. And I kept learning things that absolutely blew my mind. And I kept saying to my colleagues in coaching, why didn't anyone ever teach me this before? And I was learning things about parenting and saying, when, when I became a dad, why didn't they hand me this book or hand me this information when I, when I picked up my daughter from the hospital? They just said, you know, here you go, don't, don't screw this up. Well, I also talked to parents. I talked to parents whose kids were a little bit older, and I asked them, what would you like to pass on? What did you learn from this journey? And they kept saying two things to me. They kept saying, number one, this goes by so quickly, so enjoy this time with your kids. And number two, they kept saying, if I knew 10 years ago what I know now about what's important, what's important to my child, the lessons they learned, it wasn't winning some tournament at 10 years old or 11 years old. It was the lessons they learned. It was the great coaches they got to spend time with. It was the great people on their teams. That's what they remember. And I also talked to kids. And when I talked to kids, I said, what is the one message that you wish your parents could get? And what they said to me was, I only get one childhood, so let this belong to me. And so that journey led to the writing of my book. That journey led to the, change, the founding the Change in the Game project. Now, I want to talk about a couple of the obstacles that we face. If we want to create a player-centered environment, we have to realize that I think there are three main things that we uh, face that make that difficult. And then one of the first ones is early specialization. We now live in a world, in youth sports, and this is all around the world, where kids are being asked to do more, more, more at younger and younger ages. And yes, early specialization is a great thing if you want to win now. But what all the science says about early specialization is that for long-term player development, it's not a good thing. Children who play multiple sports play sports longer. They become better athletes. Children who play multiple sports burn out at a far less rate than children who only play one sport. Children who play multiple sports find more enjoyment. Children who play only one sport in the last study done by the University of Loyola get injured 70 to 90 percent more than multi-sport athletes. 70 to 90 percent. Yet we have this environment where we're asking our kids to make these decisions younger and younger. And yet some of our best athletes will tell you that the reason they became good was they fell in love with their sport, but they did many, many others. Number two, because we're specializing early, we have this massive emphasis on winning over development. Now, high-performing athletes don't focus on winning. What they do is they focus on excellence. And excellence is about the process of getting better. Winning is about an outcome, and we can't really control that outcome. But what happens is, when we focus on winning over development, some children don't play. They don't get in the game. We have a short bench in hockey. They don't even get in in soccer where we have limited substitutions. And it's really sad because we don't really know 
when children are 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, if they're ever going to make it. The third thing, because we're specializing early, because of this emphasis on winning, we have what I call the difference between talent selection and talent identification. When we are selecting talent, what we're doing is we're picking the kids that help us win in the short term, in the next month, in the next six months. And when we're talking about young players, talent selection is usually picking the oldest kids, the kids who are a little bit bigger, a little bit faster, a little bit stronger. But it's not identifying talent for the long term. And identifying talent is very, very hard. And if we want to have our best players playing at the highest levels, if we want them to go play for Mel, if we want them to go play for Calgary or Edmonton, then we need our best players in the developmental funnel for longer. And when we're cutting kids at seven, eight, nine years old, and we're picking all-star teams, what happens then is that those kids get funneled out from the best coaching. Now, I have to tell a personal story about this one. Um, the year 2000, I was coaching soccer at the University of Vermont. And University of Vermont hockey is very, very big there. And they've had a proud tradition of some very, very talented players. Well, my first summer there, I got to meet one of those players. He was about 25 years old. He had been a top goal scorer everywhere he played, from junior level on up. He was one of the best players in college hockey, yet he went undrafted as a senior. He had toiled for a few more years. He's still trying to get into the pros. That summer I met him and spent a lot of time with him. He had played 12 games, I believe, the year before in the NHL. And yet he's still working away. He was the hardest working guy I have ever met in any sport in my entire life. I would bring my team to the weight room at 7 a.m. and he'd been there since 6. We were done at 8.30, he was there till 10.30. Then he would go skate with all the other guys. Then he'd go to lunch and he'd come to my office and say, hey, you want to go for a run? Hey, you want to uh, get a little 3v3 soccer game going so I can play more? And here's a guy who is 25 where every talent scout, the best people in the world are saying, I don't think he's going to make it. I don't think he's good enough. And yet he believed he could and he believed he had the talent. He's playing right now in the Stanley Cup final. His name's Marty St. Louis. He's got a gold medal for Canada. He was the MVP of the NHL, twice the leading scorer. And at 25 years old, the best talent identifiers in the world didn't say that this guy's going to make it. And yet, in our world of youth sports, and it's not just a hockey thing, we have volunteer parents and volunteer coaches with the best of intentions deciding that 8, 9, 10-year-old kids don't have what it takes to make it. So if we really want to create a player-centered environment, we need to take the most kids and give them the coaching and give them the skills and let them grow and let them go through their growth spurt and see what happens on the other end. That's how we create a player-centered environment, by giving the most kids a chance. And that's how we get the best teams at the end when winning really starts to matter. So we want to talk about now the internal environment. Right? What is the things that makes for a player-centered environment? What makes it work for kids? I love this little equation. This was from a man named Timothy Galway. He wrote this 30 years ago in a book called The Inner Game of Tennis. Performance is potential minus interference. How children play, how any athlete plays, is their potential, which is their genetics, which is their coaching, which is their hours of practice, minus the things that interfere with this. Now, as a young coach, I thought, that my job was to pile as much on my players as possible. And as soon as I learned this, that actually my job was to strip away as much of the interference as possible. And the single greatest bit of interference is a bad state of mind. When I learned this, my players played better, my teams did better. So how do we do this? How do we strip away interference? Well, one of the first things that we have to think about is this. Are we interfering as parents and as coaches? When a player is playing hockey, when a player is playing soccer in, in my sport, they're making multiple dis conscious decisions per second. Do I, do I move up? Do I drop? Do I pass? Do I shoot? They're making these decisions over and over and over. So how many more decisions are they going to be able to make with our input? How many more things can they think about? 
Now what uh, neuroscience tells us is that there's two parts of the brain or two types of thinking. And the simplest way to put it is bottom-up thinking and top-down thinking. Now when we train players, what we're doing is we're training them to learn techniques, to learn skills, so that they bec can become bottom-up, subconscious things. So a, a player to pass who's played a lot of hockey doesn't think about when they're skating what edge of my skate, how to edge my skate or how to pass. A player playing soccer doesn't think about how I kick a ball properly. They just do it because of hours and hours and hours and hours of practice.